Hello, this is Professor Anders Fremsted, and I'm going to provide you with your first video lecture on the capitalist revolution. In the 14th century, Muhammad ibn Battuta traveled much of the known world. And when he reached Bengal, he wrote that Bengal is a country of great extent and one in which rice is extremely abundant. Indeed, I've seen no region of the earth in which provisions are so plentiful. Today, the incomes in Bengal both India and Bangladesh, are some of the lowest you have in the world. Right? Between 10 and 25% of the people of India and Bangladesh are living on less than $2 per day. One of the things that we want to understand in economics is how it is that incomes have evolved across countries and over time. And that's what the first figure in your readings for today show. Right, the income per capita in Britain, Japan, Italy, China, and India over the last thousand years. And what you see is a hockey stick. Right? Relative incomes change over time. So if you go back to the year 1000, China is the richest country of these five. By 1500, we see that Italy in green is the richest country. By 1800, we see Britain was the richest country. And in 2018, if the United States were on the map, we'd see the United States is even richer than Britain today. But perhaps what's most striking about this figure is that before about 1800, there was little sustained economic growth in any of these countries, right? So that from 1800 and before, for centuries, right, people were no better off than their grandparents or great grandparents. Meanwhile, after 1800, First in Great Britain, and then more recently in some of these other countries, you see sustained economic growth, right? The likes that humanity has never seen before. We can put together the data in these figures thanks to the work of economist Angus Madison, who collected this data on income per capita over the last thousand years. I encourage you while you're reading the book to watch the videos that are embedded in the text but James Heckman and Thomas Piketty make a strong case in the introductory chapter of our text that economics needs facts and that it's from economic facts that we build the economic theories, right, to try to explain them. So when we measure living standards, we commonly rely on gross domestic product or GDP to measure an economy's size. GDP is at once the market value of all the goods produced within a country, which is exactly equal by construction to the total income earned within a country. And the reason for that is the market value of all the goods produced in a country, right? The value of all those goods are produced and sold, right? All that money ultimately ends up being income for someone in that country as well. Now, we often rely on GDP per capita to measure living standards, right? GDP per capita is simply income per person, so GDP divided by population. In the previous figure, right, we compared these countries on the basis of GDP per capita in order to compare the living standards of Britons versus Chinese and so on, taking into account that Britain has many fewer people than China, for example. So we want to look at the amount of income per person as opposed to just the income, the GDP of those countries. In the United States in 2017, GDP per capita was $59,532. $59, in 2020, in 2019, it would be a little higher than that. 2020 is still too early to tell. Disposable income then measures a person's or a household's living standard. And the way we do that is we add up the household's wages plus any profit that they earn, plus any rent that they earn on extra properties, plus interest they earn on savings in a bank, minus the taxes they pay, plus the dollar transfers they get from government, perhaps in the form of Social Security. Right, you can think of a household's disposable income as how much money you can spend without going into debt. But while economists rely a lot on GDP per capita, you have to think about whether or not that is a good measure of well-being. Pause the video for a second and think about whether or not GDP per capita, $59,000 in the United States, 
roughly, whether or not that is a good measure of the economic well-being of this country. Now, you may have thought of a lot of reasons for what GDP per capita misses. Robert Kennedy, 1968, elucidated some of these in a famous speech. He wrote, our gross domestic product, oh, excuse me, gross national product, very similar, now over $8,800 billion, or $19 trillion today. But that gross domestic product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising, and ambulances to clear highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder and chaotic sprawl. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worldwide, worthwhile. RFK's point here, right, is that some of the things we buy and sell are things that we buy and sell that we would rather not have to buy, right? Um, clearing the highways of carnage is important work, but of course, if we could just reduce the amount of carnage, that would be better than just paying people to clear it, right? And at the same time, right, gross domestic product ignores some things, such as the quality of our environment, which is seldom bought and sold, and so it's not get accounted for. So GDP per capita and GDP have some serious shortcomings. Nevertheless, they do provide some measure of the material things that we have access to in this country, right? It measures living standards. Another way to look at living standards besides just GDP per capita is to recognize that within countries, living standards vary a lot, right? Between poor people in countries and the rich people in those countries. This figure in your book, is showing you the global income distribution in 1980, where the width of each country's sort of position on this chart is proportional to their population. China in 1980 had one of the lowest GDP per capita in the world, and there are a lot of Chinese people, so that's a very wide bar. Same with India here. In the United States, we're right here, right? You see also almost 300 million people at the time, also a fairly wide bar. What this figure does is it recognizes that in the United States, you have people in the bottom 10% of the income distribution, the next 10%, the next 10%, we call these deciles, all the way up to the richest 10%, where the richest 10% are making large incomes and the poorest 10% are making low incomes, not much higher, right, or even lower, than the richest folks in, in a country like Nigeria, for example. Over time, the income distribution changed. By 1990, some of the countries that were the poorest, such as China, have climbed up the distribution in GDP per capita. The other thing you see happening over time is that the skyscrapers in the back, right, the richest 10% in a bunch of countries, see their incomes go up from 1980 to 1990, and again, even more so by 2014, the most recent data that we have available to us, right? By today, right, China is more than two thirds of the way up the global income distribution. And in the United States, while you're not any better off if you're in the poorest decile than you were in 1980, you're much better off if you're lucky enough to be born into the richest decile, into the richest 10%, right? So over time, when you look at the data this way, you see both that some countries have grown at a much faster rates than others, especially China, for example, over the last few decades. You also see that within most countries, a lot of the gains from economic growth have gone to those at the top of the income distribution. Right? Take another moment to think about how much income you need right, to be rich or to live a dignified life or how much money you hope to earn when you graduate from Colorado State University. I encourage you to take this quiz that the New York Times published last year. Right? You can either type in this link or just search New York Times, Are You Rich? And you can take the quiz to see where you or your family fit in the income distribution of this country. The reason I encourage you to do that is often 
hard to get a sense of where we fit because we get very used to thinking about the amount of money we have or our parents have as being sort of normal. Right? Um, if you take this quiz, right, it'll walk you through how Americans misunderstand the income distribution. If you ask Americans whether or not their income is average, right, well, what you see is that most people in the middle of the distribution, in the 50th or 60th percentiles, right, over 60 or 70 percent of people in those percentiles think their income is about average. And of course, they're about right. If you're in a 50th percentile, your income is sort of exactly average. Right? But a lot of people who are poorer than that and surprisingly richer than that also see their incomes as largely average. Right? Here's another figure showing you how, where do you rank in the actual income distribution and where do you perceive you rank in the actual income distribution. Right? Folks in the bottom 30 percentile of the United States, right, in the bottom 30 percent of the United States, right, they have a pretty good understanding of where they actually do fit in income distribution. They think they're poor and they are pretty poor compared to most of the people in the United States. Right? As you get richer though in the United States, more and more people think they're actually further down the income distribution than they are. So even folks in, for example, almost the 99th percentile, right, so they're richer than 99 percent of households in the United States, they actually think they're in something like the 80th percentile. They think they're richer than just 80 percent, but there are a bunch of people richer than them. And of course, in their neighborhoods, in their cities, there might be a bunch of people who are richer than them. Um, but that's why it's useful to compare where you are to the actual data. Now, besides measuring income, we'd like to be able to measure economic growth. The growth rate is always just the change in GDP divided by the original level of GDP. So for example, if you want to know the growth rate in the year 2000, and in terms of British GDP per capita, you could take what's the GDP per capita in 2001, subtract out what it was in 2000, right? that could see the change in GDP, and divide that by what the original level of GDP was in 2000. In this case, it'd be 21,567 minus 21,046 divided by 21,046. What you would get is 0 0.024755. That's equal to about 2.5%, right? To go from a decimal to percent, you move the decimal spot over two spaces, then you call the percent, and we round the four up to a five because the next digit is a seven. Right? This means in the year 2000, British GDP per capita grew at a rate of about 2.5%. Right? This is useful for going back to our figure showing GDP per capita over time. Right? For 800 years or so in this figure, there was very little growth of GDP per capita, and then there was strong sustained growth. Right? You can look at exactly the same data over what we'll call a ratio scale. Right? The difference between this figure and this figure right, is simply the scale we're using on the vertical axis. They're showing us exactly the same data, but in our conventional scale, right, we look at GDP per capita at 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 over a linear scale. We can look at the same data on a ratio scale, right, where we start at 250, then 500, then not 750, but 1,000. Right? And instead of just adding the same amount, every line here, we're doubling our space on the vertical axis. So you go from 1,000 to 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, 16,000, 32,000. The nice thing about this ratio scale is it makes it easier to see the differences in incomes over the first 800 years. Right? You see actually that Italy was quite a bit richer than Japan, for example, about over three times as rich for centuries there. Right. The other thing that you see on a ratio scale, though, is you get a better idea of what the difference in the growth rate is. Right. So if you go back to the equation from the previous slide, you'll see that even if you grew at a constant growth rate, right, you're going to get an exponential curve on a linear scale. And the reason for that is because compared to your new base, right, if you grow at the same rate, say 2.5% a year, right, in the beginning, 2.5%, on a low income is going to not raise your income very much, but once your income is higher, it's going to raise your income more. So you get an exponential curve 
on a linear scale, on a ratio scale, the nice thing about it is that the slope of the line is proportional to the growth rate. And so you can see, for example, that Britain started growing earlier than other countries, right? A little bit even, 1700, but especially 1800, you see the line starts getting quite steep. Whereas other countries then industrialized later, right? Actually got even more phenomenal growth rates once they start industrializing, right? China, the purple curve here, is particularly vertical, right? Where not a lot of growth until about 1950, 1960, right? But then phenomenal growth for decades. And so your first homework problem, homework 1.1, is going to cover both linear and ratio skills. Well, you'll use some data and think about that data on both scales. Now, the question we have for this lecture is what happened to Britain about 1800 to go from a growth rate of you know, maybe about 1% a year to about 2% a year, not just for a few years, but for two centuries, which ended up taking their incomes from about $2,000 per capita, right, to nearly $30,000. Of course, many of you probably remember from history class that what happened is the Industrial Revolution. Right? And what we're going to call that in this course is the Permanent Technological Revolution. So in economics, a technology is a process that uses a set of inputs, including materials, machinery, and labor, to produce an output. Technological progress, then, means we require fewer inputs to produce the same output. For millennia, technological progress was very slow. But since the Industrial Revolution, we have witnessed a permanent technological revolution. We consistently find out ways of doing things with fewer inputs, often with less labor. We find right, ways of doing things that require less work. Think about a washing machine. A washing machine represents tremendous technological progress. Have you ever washed clothes by hand? It takes an enormous amount of time, right? If you have a washing machine, of course, you have to buy the machine, right? That takes a few days or weeks, actually, to save up money to buy that machine. But then every time you wash clothes, it saves you so much time that it's worth owning a washing machine. You see history's hockey stick in a bunch of technologies. Here, Right, you see it in lighting. So each dot in this figure shows you how much light could be produced with one hour of labor. Going back to simple technology discovered 100,000 years ago of just open fires, right? You just collect firewood, you light a fire or keep a fire going. You know, how much light do you produce with one hour of labor? Well, not very much, right? Campfires don't, they put off light, but of course you need to collect quite a bit of wood to do it. Right. But as we move to better technologies for producing fire, right, up to candles, whale oil lamps around here, finally incandescent light bulbs, maybe some around here, fluorescent light bulbs, finally LED light bulbs today, right? What we see is we're not a little bit better at producing light with an hour of labor. We're massively better. Notice here we're on a ratio scale. So now we produce 10 million right, lumen hours per hour of labor, almost 10 million, as opposed to in 1800, maybe about 100. It's not that we're a few times better, we're like 100,000 times better at producing light than we used to be. That's the permanent technological revolution. All right, we see the same thing in the speed of information transmission. For centuries, information moved at roughly the speed of walking places, right, about one mile per hour, right? But then rapidly in the 19th century, we got faster and faster at moving information. Um, Lincoln's assassination in 1865 moved to the west coast of the United States at an average speed of 12 miles per hour, which is a combination of both telegraph cable and some distances still taken over by Pony Express. Right. So for centuries, information traveled at one mile per hour. Today, fiber optic cables transmit information at nearly the speed of light. Of course, not everything we've seen over the last couple centuries have been good. We also see a hockey stick in climate, where if you look at global carbon emissions, right before 1800, they were essentially zero. They've taken off largely, and that's reflected in atmospheric CO2, which for centuries 
was well below 300 parts per million and now is approaching 400 parts per million. Right? And of course, following that is also temperature, which does vary a lot year to year. Right? You see a lot of variation. Right? The climate is complicated. Um, but over the last century, you see a clear uptick in, in temperatures. And of course, we're expecting that to continue. This reminds us that the economy is actually a part of society, which is part of the biosphere, which is part of the physical environment. If you're interested in environmental economics, I encourage you to take Econ 240 and to read Unit 20 of this course. Now, all of this is pretty abstract, so I want to provide you with a bit of a personal view on history's hockey stick. So this is a poor family in the Norwegian fjords. Um, a little over a hundred years ago, right? And they're basically just subsisting. This is almost pre-capitalist sort of living for them. They mostly are living off things that they themselves produce. This girl here is my grandma Louise, right? Um, so this is about 1910. And so my grandmother was a peasant in Norway, essentially. But she ended up immigrating to the United States Right? And she ended up canning salmon and tuna for bumblebee and making more money than her parents could have possibly imagined, owning things that they could have never imagined, right? including a car, sending one of her kids to college, right? um, owning a house in town, and so on. Right? Capitalism completely transformed my grandmother's life. Right? And it completely transformed her living standard, where the way she lived which is almost unthinkable based on where she'd come from. And I think if you think about your own family histories, most of you will not need to go back very many generations right, before your ancestors were essentially peasants, living off the land, not making very much money, and having a pretty simple life. If you think about how that's transformed the last few generations, that's history's hockey stick. So the next task for us is to try to explain history's hockey stick and income. And what I want you to consider is that capitalism can explain it. That capitalism explains why it is that incomes were flat for so long and then with the advent of capitalism started growing for the first sustained period of human history.